So please open your Bibles with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In the Pew Bible, that's on page 1770, 1770. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The title of the sermon this morning is The Gospel is of First Importance. The Gospel is of First Importance. Let us read together. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So far God's holy and inerrant word. Verse 3 tells us... <coughs> that Paul delivered to the Corinthians what he received first of all. You see verse 3, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. Now, the King James also says first of all, but the older sense of the phrase is of prime importance, of first importance. And the uh, Many other translations, the RSV, for example, and the ESV say, translate, for I deliver to you as of first importance this gospel. The NIV, for what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. And that indeed is the, the sense of, the, uh, of all the translations. Uh, but it, it's brought out a little more clearly when we state it explicitly. I deliver to you as of first importance, or first of all. That's the sense of the Greek. Some things are more important than others. In life, we sometimes have to differentiate between what is important and what is more important. Now, there's a preacher that I listened to that used this illustration, which I thought is a good one. This is uh, Stuart Olliot. He said, if a man injures his finger, say somebody you know, you're Ted in front here, uh, you talk to Donna through the week and she said, well, I'm sorry, but Ted had a terrible accident uh, at home fixing something, or, and he, and he, he uh, severely injured one or two of his fingers. And you speak to her and she says, well, I'm sorry, it looks like they will have to amputate the finger. Uh, but give him a few days and then you go and visit him in the hospital. Now, whom among you will not go? I mean, whom among you will say, well, you know, that's not the same Ted. I mean, the Ted I knew had all these fingers. <laughs> no. We would all go, would we not? So after a few days, you go to the hospital and you visit Ted. And he says, yeah, well, they said they will keep me here a few days longer just to make sure everything is fine. But the next week you come, Donna meets you in the, in the hall of the hospital and she says, well, I'm sorry, that it, you know, Ted is not quite his usual self. Uh, bad news, the infection spread and they had to amputate his arm. Well, who of you will not go and still visit uh, Ted? You'll still go, won't you? I mean, it is still Ted. Uh, he's without an arm. But at what point will you stop going? Now, let's, we can push this illustration. The next week you go and you're met by the physician, the doctor, and he says, well, th this is very um, peculiar. It rarely happens, but the infection spread to the other arm, 
and we had to amputate his other arm. Would you still go? Is it still Ted? Or the week after, the physician says, I'm, you know, this is getting very serious. We had to remove one of his legs. So there he is, both arms. Uh, he lost both arms, lost one of his legs. He still has one leg. At what point will, will you say, well, this is not, this is not Ted anymore. I'm, I'm going to stop going. Any, uh, anybody here who, who would say, no, that, that's it, I'm, I'm not going. <clears throat> well, the week, the next week, the physician and Donna tells you they, they had to take off the other leg as well. Now, now he's without arms, without legs. But the week after, the doctor meets you and he's very pale. Indeed, you've never seen a man like this and he's in quite a state. He says, well, you may want to reconsider visiting Ted because um, it has come to that we had to amputate his head as well. <laughs> no, 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 would you, I mean, you would, anybody that would go ahead and say, no, no, I still want to visit? No, right? I mean, at this point, you would say, this is no longer Ted. Um, you have, you know, it's, it's, it's not alive anymore. This was so important to his uh, being who he is that once this is removed, it's no longer the same person. He's certainly not alive anymore. Which is not to say that our arms are not important or our legs or any of our limbs are not important. But some things in life are more important than others. Some things are more important than others. And that is the case with the Bible too. Of course, everything in the Bible is important, which is why God gave it to us. But the gospel is of first importance to the Christian faith. You can, you can remove many things from the Christian faith. You can remove many things from church and from church life. But if you remove the gospel, it is no longer Christianity. It is no longer the Christian faith. Which is why Paul says in verse 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, of first importance, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the, according to the Scriptures. Now, Paul had, by this time, written about many things in this letter. And who can deny that they are important? I mean, talking about the apostleship, the church offices, for example, talking about divisions in the church, these are important matters, are they not? About wisdom, about matters of Christian conscience, about sexual immorality and purity in marriage, about matters of divorce, that's important, is it not? Is it important? It's very important. The role of women in the church, is that important? It's very important. Um, if you just page through the letter of Corinthians, you know, he deals with the Lord's Supper, uh, head coverings, order in the worship service, spiritual gifts, and uh, speaking in tongues. Chapter 13 talks about love. That is very important, is it not? But in verse 15 he says, and this is the, the first time he says this, is of first importance. This is of prime importance. And he summarizes the gospel for us. This is of prime importance. And the message this morning briefly wants to un unpack, uh, unpack two of the implications of this. What does it mean if the gospel is of first importance? It means, first of all, that the gospel should be of first importance for the church. Look at verse 1. This is written to the brothers, the brethren, 
Moreover, brethren, the letter is written to the Corinthian church, the gathered church. And he declares to them the gospel which I preach to you. Now, you here is plural. This is talking about the church, the body of Christ, the visible body, which also you received and in which you stand or by which you stand. The Greek word for in and by is the same word, en, the Greek word en. By which you stand, or in which you stand, the two go together. And the Greek word for stand is a military term. It show, it, it's, the, it's the term for um, an army, for example, a military unit that, that hold their ground. The gospel is of first importance because it is the gospel that allows the church to remain standing. And there are many things we can take away from the church. And it will be a compromised church. It will not be a healthy church. And those things are important. But it will still be a church. But once the gospel is removed, it, is no, longer, it no longer deserves the name of Christian church. Now, to pick up on the army metaphor, I mean, it is possible that an army, that you take away some features of an army. For example, if you talk to my boys, they will tell you an army has soldiers, and they have uniforms, and they bear arms. But you know, it's possible that an army have these things removed from them. If we think of Washington's Continental Army in the Revolutionary War, for example. For many months, this was a rather bedraggled army. Many of them did not have proper uniforms. In fact, many of them did not have proper clothes. Many of them did not have shoes. But they were still an army. Many of them did not have firearms. They did not have bayonets. Some of them didn't have bullets but it was still an army. And though we associate you know, physical strength with soldiers and an army, in Washington's time, many of his soldiers were lying sick in their tents for many months. But it still was an army because it still had that spiritual element of, of loyalty to a cause, of loyalty to the leader, to General Washington, to the cause of independence. And even though many other things were removed, they were still united as an army spiritually around the cause, and they still could be called an army. And it is possible that a church have several things removed that we do not want to remove from a church. Say a church has an unhealthy form of church government, or all sorts of innovations are made, or they have a different doctrine of baptism, or... Uh, some features of the Lord's Supper are compromised. Well, they are still a church as long as the gospel there is preached purely and lives and reigns as Christ has revealed it to us in Scripture. But the gospel is of prime importance. This is the most important thing. And this brings us to the question, how do we consciously esteem and prioritize in our church life the gospel. And I know I'm asking this to a church who's at a crossroads, making decisions about the future, and that happens in the life of a church. Do you prioritize the gospel? And I'm not, you understand, I'm not suggesting that that is not happening. Are you holding your pastor to account? And I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with his preaching or his theology. But will you have the courage three years from now, five years from now, to confront a pastor who possibly preaches a different gospel? Subtly, perhaps, but a different go gospel nonetheless. That can happen. Good and faithful churches have departed from the truth. But if we esteem the gospel, prioritize it, hold fast to the uh, word of God as it has been revealed, 
as we have it summarized in our Westminster standards, that means we should have the courage of confronting, God forbid, an elder who departs from the truth or a pastor who departs from the truth. Because the gospel is that by which the church stands. Now, this church is more than 70 years old. And, of course, we thank the Lord for that blessing to have remained standing for so many years. That's a big blessing. But it's not automatic. We need God's grace. This is just God's grace. Others who were as faithful as you 70 years ago have long departed from the true gospel. Pray for your church. Ask the Lord for His grace, for His preserving grace, for His gospel. Now read your Bible, know your Bible, prize the precious gospel revealed in it and systematized and explained in the Reformed and Presbyterian standards. Pray, pray, pray for your church. You know, <clears throat> there are many churches that still go through the motions of being a church but where the gospel is no longer present. I'm sure you can name many of them. I can name one extreme example. We have in Grand Rapids a church, a beautiful old church. It's 150 or 180 years old. And I will tell you its name. Its name is Fountain Street Church. So you can go and check this up on YouTube and look at some of the sermons uh, that they have there. Many of the trappings are the trappings of a church. They have a beautiful uh, bell tower or clock tower, what do you call it? It's a beautiful Gothic style sandstone building, uh, rosewood pews, and magnificent stained glass. It is a gorgeous building. It's, it's impressive. And when you walk in, there's a prominent pulpit, very artistically done, craftsmanship is impressive. And they go through many of the rituals that churches go through. But you know what? The gospel has long departed from this church. And I say this without fear of contradiction, because they would admit it. They do not even preach that there is a God who is personal God in heaven, or that Jesus Christ truly died and rose again. They would deny all these things. They still use the religious language like prayer, but they redefine it. Prayer would be some kind of meditation. Yet strangely, they call themselves a church. They come together on a Sunday. They have some rituals that resemble a church. And why am I telling you this? Well, simply to say, you, uh, say to you that the gospel is of prime importance once you let that slip. Who knows where you can end up? And this church is one example. It's an extreme example, I admit. A very extreme example. But that a body of people can still go through the motions outwardly of being a church while having lost the truth of the Bible and the truth of the gospel. Well, that should be a somber warning to all of us. Do we consciously prioritize the gospel in our church? And then a second question. Do you prioritize the gospel-centered church in your life, in your own individual life, and in your family life? Now, <clears throat> many of you I know um, are committed to this church to the extent of driving great distances. And that you know, that certainly shows um, that the gospel-centered church has priority in your life, at this point at least. But you may be tempted six months from now or a year from now to say, well, you know, we have a church ten minutes from where we live. Why not go there? And there would be no objection to that if that church also is a gospel-centered gospel-rooted, gospel-permeated church. Praise the Lord for His gift of churches, faithful churches across the length and breadth of this country. But you know, it's not in every town. It's not in every city. 
Do you prioritize the gospel and the gospel-centered church in your life, in your choice of church? And I speak to people sometimes, and I'm sure you too, family, friends, colleagues, and ask them, well, why are you at so-and-so church? And the answers sometimes are surprising. Well, I just, I just love their worship times, you know? Somebody told me he goes to this church for one reason only, they meet on a Saturday evening. And then I have the whole Sunday to do various other things. Or, you just love the children's programs. I have been told that. I love the children's programs. This is why I am in church X, Y, or Z. Or, I love the facilities. Or, you know, my, my parents have always gone to that church. Or my, my children and my grandchildren are in that church. And then you ask them, and how about the theology? Well, yeah, we're, we're a little uneasy about some of the aspects of theology. We don't agree with everything. And how about the gospel? Is the gospel being taught purely like the Lord revealed it to us in Scripture? Well, um, it's not explicitly unbiblical. <laughs> you see where this is going? Once you start letting this slip, once you start compromising, you are no, lo no longer doing what Paul does, prioritizing, saying the gospel is of first importance in the church and in my life. And we have to prioritize the gospel-centered church then in our major life decisions too. Sometimes in our choice of work in accepting or declining a promotion, if that means going to a city or a town where we don't know of a faithful gospel-centered church, do you accept? Do you go? Do you take up the offer? And sometimes, yeah, that is true enough, life happens. We have to move for work reasons, for family reasons, for whatever reasons. But does the church and the gospel factor into your decision-making? That's the question, you see. And you may be there uh, months from now or years from now. I remember a colleague I worked with at an American company uh, years, years ago, must be 15 years ago, and they were looking at moving. They felt they uh, wanted to go somewhere else. <clears throat> and this company, because it's a big international company, had offices everywhere from Hong Kong to Sydney, and Amsterdam, and New York, and San Francisco. So they had many options. And finally, she told me, so we have made our decision. And I was very interested. And I said, oh, well, so which is it? Chicago, she said. And then, you know, I'm, I'm, I was intrigued by this. You know, how do you decide you have all these options? How, how ever did you come up with Chicago? And she said, well, you know, it's a major decision. My career and my wife and my husband's, and, you know, we both had to. So it's work options, career opportunities. But you also have to look at the school system for the children and the hospitals and the healthcare system. You have to look at the taxes. You have to look at the uh, traffic. You know, how long are you going to spend in traffic on your way to church? So many considerations. The weather, you know, you have to look at the weather. Although, you know, how did anybody decide, uh, you know, to go to Chicago if the weather is one of the <laughs> considerations? <laughs> I don't know. It must be the windiest, windiest city on earth. But she, she mentioned all these things. She said 30. We had 30 criteria. And very systematically, we put them on a spreadsheet, on our Excel spreadsheet, and we attached weights to all of them, and we kind of, you know, factored in. And <clears throat> the winner is Chicago. And I said, so how about the church? Oh, well, um, we haven't really thought about that much. <laughs> now, I'm sure they are good and f uh, faithful gospel, or I hope they are, in uh, Chicago. They were until recently, at least. But the point is, here was a major life decision that would shape the future of this 
mother and father and their, and their children for years to come. And the gospel faithfulness of a church was not one of the considerations. It was not one of the 30, let alone the prime consideration in making a major life decision. So, if, if truly, if we say this is true, this is of first importance, then it has to f factor into our major life decisions, does it not? So that's the first thing. The gospel is of first importance because it's of first importance for the church. It is the, it is the one thing by which the church stands or falls. But secondly, the gospel is of first importance for you, for your soul, for you individually, and of course for your loved ones. Look at verse 2. <clears throat> I declare to you the gospel, verse 1 says, and then verse 2, by which also you are saved. This is by which you are saved. If, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. The problem with attending a church where the gospel is fudged is that many people in a church like that may think they are saved, but they are not. They may think they are going to heaven, but they are not. Because they haven't had, and they do not repeatedly have, the gospel presented to them in clear biblical terms. That Christ died for the sins of his people. That unless you personally believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, repent of your sins and trust in him, you will not be saved. The gospel is of, of, of prime importance for your soul, by which you are saved. And look at these warn, uh, words which should serve as something of a warning. If you hold fast that word which I preach to you, if you hold fast, you see, it may be that somebody believes, thinks, I should uh, stress, thinks he believes, and then falls away from the faith because he never truly believed. There were wrong connections. There were wrong inferences. There were wrong reasonings. There were wrong reasons why he thought he believed. He never truly believed the gospel and therefore can fall away from the gospel. Now we praise God that belief, that faith, is a work of the Holy Spirit. That if the Lord gives a man or a woman or a child faith, that faith, because it is the work of God, can never be eradicated. It can never die. You have eternal life now. If any of you, and I trust that is the case of all of you, I pray that would be the case of at least almost all of you, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ now, you have eternal life right now. And you can never lose it. That is the gospel. That is the gospel. Now you say, well, I know of a person who said he grew up in a Christian church and he believed all these things and, and then he stopped believing. Well, I think the Bible is very clear that that person never had true faith. But you see, this is why it's so important. If you have true faith, you will hold it fast to the end. If you think you're a Christian because you're baptized, if you think you are a Christian because you attend church regularly, if you think you are a Christian because you are perhaps not as bad as some other people you know, that is not true faith. That is not a saving faith. You are not a Christian. And therefore, we have these words added in verse 2, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. If you hold fast. <clears throat> See, if you, if you do not hold fast, you believed in vain. Now the Greek for in vain can mean two things. It can either mean um, without proper reason, you, you became angry in vain. You became angry without the proper reason. Or it can mean without proper effect. I tried to fix the, the dishwasher in vain. I tried to fix my lawnmower in vain. 
my wife recognizes those words because when I try to fix something, it is often in vain. <laughs> There's often not the, not the hoped for effect is often not there. <clears throat> uh, in this case, I think primarily the, the focus is on the reason you believed in, in vain. You did not properly believe. You did not believe, you see, the gospel. You thought you believed because there were all sorts of external reasons which brought you to church and brought you close to the gospel, but you never grasped it. You never truly believed. Another illustration which uh, Oliot gives, and I think it's a good illustration, is if you go on vacation, let, let's say to Africa. Any of you been to Africa on vacation? It's a wonderful place. Oh, oh yes. Okay, yeah. Some of you have been. It is a wonderful place. It is also a dangerous place. Very unstable uh, societies and certainly very unstable governments. So it has happened in the past, in, in many cases, that uh, a call goes out from the embassy. Say you are on vacation and you hear, you listen uh, on the radio to the Voice of America, international service, or you, you look on the internet and you see that I am vacationing in Burundi or in the Congo and the embassy says there is a civil war, the rebels are, have seized part of the country, they are very cruel, they are dangerous. We are calling on all Americans to assemble at the airport where you will be airlifted to safety. Oh, and you are very relieved. I mean, uh, <clears throat> you know the dangers that are facing you. You hear the terrible reports of death and, uh, and uh, you know, you see some of the pictures in the media and you are very relieved. So you go, you, you gather your family, you, you go to the airport and here, you, to your surprise, you discover there are thousands of people at the airport. And you talk to some of them and you talk to one person and you say, well, you know, um, are you an American? Or, you know, oh, no, no, I'm not an American. I, I live here. Oh, so why are you here? Oh, I wa I've always wanted to go to America, you see. I've heard about it and I, you know, I, it sounds like a wonderful place. Well, perhaps somebody here may think that I, I've always wanted to go to heaven. And, and I believe there is a, such a place as heaven. Does that make you a Christian? No, it does not. Now, of course, I'm not saying America is heaven, right? <laughs> you, you, you get that? This is, just, this is just an illustration. But the fact that you really desire to go to heaven does not make you a Christian. You have to believe the gospel. The gospel is of first importance. Or perhaps uh, somebody else would say, you ask, you know, are you an American? Oh, no. But, you know, I like Americans. I've always gotten along fine with Americans. Um, I feel at home among them. And it is possible that somebody here feels at home among Christians. They are caring people, they are kind and loving people, and you feel that, you know, you feel at home here. But that's not enough to take you to heaven. That's important. But it's not, a, I mean, it's important to, to have these things in church, but that is not the gospel. That's not what takes you to heaven. You speak to somebody else. Are you? Why are you here? Well, no, I'm not an American, but you know, I'm a good person. I'm not at all like some of those rebels or those uh, out of control government troops that are killing people and sh uh, sowing carnage and burning uh, property. I've never done any harm in my life. So I think. I, I think I should go. And somebody may think, well, I'm going to heaven because I'm not as bad as many other people that I know. But that's not the gospel, is it? Somebody else says, well, yeah, I, are you an American? No, I, but I was born an American and um, many of my family are. My, my father and my siblings, or perhaps my children. Uh, my grandfather was, was an American. I renounced, I renounced my American citizenship, but, but I still have a connection. And it's possible that somebody here th says, well, you know, I was baptized. Um, my father and mother were in church, and my grandparents, and 
perhaps my father was an elder, and uh, we have always had a connection with the church. That's not enough. The gospel, you have to believe the gospel, is it not? Without believing anything else, anything else is in vain, which is exactly what, what Paul says in verse 2. Unless you believed in vain. If you do not believe the gospel, your faith is in vain. It's in vain. It's fake. It's counterfeit. It is not the true item. What do you need? Well, at that airport, you will have to take out your passport and show, here, I am an American citizen. And each and every person who wants to go to heaven, who wants to be sa- has to be able to take out their passport and say, I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm one of God's people. I'm one of Christ's people. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've repented of my sins. I've trusted Him. I've prioritized the Lord Jesus and His gospel in my life. This is what saves me. And this is what is of first importance for my soul. Not only for my church as an entity, as an institution, although there too, but also for me as an individual. I have to trust in the gospel. This is why the gospel is of first importance. Let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, our Father, we thank you for the gospel that you have given us, that you have recorded it for us in the Bible, and that it is of first importance. We thank you too for this passage. We pray that you would bless this passage in our hearts. Help us to understand it. Shape our lives by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.